Today's guest is a former senior Hollywood executive, psychologist and author of the best-selling book, Boomer Reinvention. Over the past decade, he has helped more than a thousand people find their dream career. In today's live stream, he's going to share with you new insights, ideas and information to find a meaningful career. Would you please help us welcome our good friend, John Tarnoff. John, welcome. Thank you, Daniel. Great to be here. My pleasure. Well, if uh, if there's anything that we want on this planet, at least 90% of things, we're going to need some money. So we're going to need to have a, uh, a steady career. You've spent 35 years in Hollywood. What was the dream that you started with and what were some of your career highlights? I was a movie fan. I think a, a lot of us uh, start off that way. I was a, a fan. I was also a photographer uh, and I got drawn into... Uh, filmmaking as a high schooler, making short films just the way a lot of uh, other filmmakers uh, started out in my backyard with my friends. And uh, that became an obsession when I got into college. I started working on TV commercial crews in New York City during the summers, got the bug, moved out to Los Angeles, got involved in the business on the production side, developing and producing movies for studios like Warner Brothers, MGM, Columbia, uh, Village Roadshow, actually, Village Roadshow Pictures is a company that I got involved with very early uh, in um, in the 80s. And uh, and then finally, uh, DreamWorks Animation in the 2000s. Wow, wow. And throughout that 35 years, you'd also been fired from at least seven careers. What had happened and how had that impacted your self-esteem? Right. Well, I kind of came across this when I was putting together a TEDx talk, which I did in 2012, which really kind of launched my career coaching practice. And I had transitioned out of my production executive and producer role. I wanted to get into something that was much more education focused. I had taken a psychology degree in 2005 to really focus more on understanding both myself and other people. And this was kind of a natural shift from an interest in content and what made movies get greenlit to the people behind them and what motivated them to do their great work. So in putting this talk together, I realized, well, what are my credentials? And you're kind of alluding to this in our conversation. What are my credentials to help people with their careers? And I realized, well, you know, I've been fired a lot. And I've been fired a lot because in the entertainment business, it's a very volatile business. You're trying to chase the taste of the mass audience. And invariably, there are going to be ups and downs along that road. So it's not uncommon for people to have a career like mine in the entertainment industry where you're up and down, in and out. And whether it was a, a regime change at a company, whether I finished a role and there was no more ramp for me, uh, all sorts of reasons. In some instances, there was a personality thing and I just butted heads with the person I was working for and he had you know, more leverage than I did, so I was out. Uh, and what you realize after negotiating, navigating through these situations a number of times is that, number one, this is the question that everyone asks me, no, it never gets easier, but you do learn what to do. Mm -hmm. So what this taught me, having been, I like to say, fired 39% of the time in my career, that's seven out of 18 jobs, is you get a sense of what the playbook is about how you're going to pick yourself up off the floor, how you're going to learn from your experience, and how you're going to apply those lessons to the situations that are coming up. Mm. I see a lot of people finding it very hard to pick themselves up after they've lost a job, and a lot of people lost their jobs during COVID. And I heard one gentleman say recently, he said, Daniel, I've been uh, resigning from my job for 15 years. I said, you've resigned from your job 15 years ago. He said, no, I'm resigning. And I said, so you're in the middle of it. He says, yes, I've been leaving for 15 years. <laughs> and I said, well, that's a very long time. What's happening? He said, I'm absolutely petrified. He said, I have created this comfort zone. I know what to expect, better or for worse. And I'm afraid to leave that comfort zone and pursue my passions. And this is not just something that's localized to, say, Malaysia, but it's also happening in the USA. And you, I try to put these this in my mind. There's 10 million jobs available right now in America. 
yet people are still struggling to find their dream career. So what is that challenge that you're seeing within them that's preventing them from finding that dream career? Well, let me unpack what you're, what you're asking here. Number one, the first question, which is, how do you uh, overcome the comfort zone? How do you get over this fear of disrupting your life, of the unknown territory that you're going into? And I would say, and it's a, it's a glib answer, and, and certainly in the career coaching work that I do with my clients, we go into a lot more depth. But I would just ask you this one question. If you are, if you're in a situation like this gentleman where you're kind of resigning for 15 years, kind of you're at the precipice of going, I can't take this anymore, but I don't want to pull the trigger. At some point, it's going to happen to you, particularly when you get older, because for some reason, whole other podcast, employers look askance at older workers. They think that older workers are getting obsolete. They want them out. There's this obsession with youth in our culture, separate conversation. So the question is, you're going to get involuntarily separated from your job. Let's just call it that. Mm. Do you want to be done to, or do you want to be the one who's doing the doing, right? Do you want to take control of your situation in your life, or do you want to be put into a situation where you're out of control? So I think that if you understand that there are steps that you can take to build resilience in your career and learn the techniques and the skills to bolster your career so you're in the driver's seat, you can make more informed, more self-honoring choices about what career you're going to do, what moves you're going to make, what opportunities you're going to attract to you. I think that solves the question of, oh, my God, you know, how, how am I going to do this, right? How am I going to just kind of, you know, face the future, right? Mm. Knowledge is power. And then to your second question about all these opportunities that are out there, how do you find your dream career? Strangely enough, this is a very similar answer to the one I just gave, which is that if you can figure out what your value proposition is, what is it that you do? You, you're familiar with this concept of ikigai. It's this Japanese idea of, of your meaning and purpose, of the practice of your meaning and purpose. Never, it's never heard of it. What you're good at, what you're going to get paid to do, what you love doing, and what the world needs. And if you can figure out the intersection of those four factors and apply it to your life, well, then you're on a good path to figuring out what your value proposition is. And as you begin to narrow down this question of, what is it that I love to do? What am I good at? What can I get paid for? What does the world need? What does the market need that's out there? You're going to start getting into conversations with people that are going to help navigate your way to those opportunities. So you're not going to be spending all your time looking around the job boards for jobs that you kind of can do. Maybe, yes, maybe you should apply for them. You and you know 2,000 other people applying to those jobs. You're getting lost in the shuffle. That's depressing as hell. You're not going to get a call back for, for an interview. And you do this over and over and over again. You think, I'm worthless. But you're not. You're just participating in a system that is stacked against you. Mm. One gentleman said to me recently, he said, Daniel, after 30 years of corporate work, the only reward that I got was bad health and not knowing who I am. And that dependence he had on the system for him scared the heck out of him. Yes. Because as he left the career and wanted to go and pursue his passion, he still didn't know what his passion was after 30 years. And it's not that he just tried to figure it out after he left his job. He'd been thinking about it for 30 years, but he still couldn't figure out what he was good at That's and right. what the world needed from him. Yeah. And it, didn't happen overnight. It took him about six months to figure out what he was really good at, his sweet spot. And as soon as he figured it out, he was blown away because he made his first million dollars in the first six months. He made it. more in six months than he had in probably a decade in his career. But he found it. But he couldn't spot. find it whilst he was in the dirty water of the career. He had to get out of that. And he Absolutely. discovered it. Yeah, sometimes you just have to kind of bite the bullet and jump into it. Uh, and, uh, 
you know, it's this old line, leap and the net will appear. Yes. And it's scary because we, as humans, we say we're people of faith. But uh, when we jump and there's no net and we can't see it, <laughs> our faith goes out of the window right. really quick. But you've got to take that leap of faith. And it's about trusting in yourself. You know, a lot of people forget, you know, I've just successfully done this career for 20 years. It might have come to an end, but all dreams must come to an end. And I know this morning my alarm was going off at about six o'clock in the morning and I was having a damn good dream. And I thought to myself, maybe I can just go back to sleep for a little bit. And I tried to go back into the dream and I couldn't get back in. So I thought I'll snooze for another nine minutes and I'll try to go back in the dream. Right. But the dream was over and eventually I just had to get out of bed That's and right. move on. And I think we all have to do that. Now, everybody would assume that you've got to have a resume. You've got to submit that resume to be able to get a job. But what you say is this is one of the worst things that you could do. Why is submitting a resume for a job application the worst way to get a job? Well, I alluded to it in the last answer, which is that you are participating in a system that's rigged against you. It's actually not particularly good for employers either. But the great news about living in a digital world is that we can get scale. And the bad news about the digital world is scale, because mm -hmm. now you are competing against all sorts of uh, other applicants who may or may not be qualified. And the employers are having a hell of a time figuring out whether you're uh, employable, whether you're qualified or not. They're running your resume through an applicant tracking system, which may or may not uh, do you justice. You know, more often than not, I would argue that it doesn't, that they, they try to make it work uh, and make it equitable, but it's impossible to do this. Uh, so by taking that approach first, you're kind of dooming yourself to failure. Whereas the truth of the matter is that 85% of hiring is done through referrals, not through applications and submissions. And when you think about it, wouldn't you rather, if you were hiring for a position, wouldn't you rather see someone based on the recommendation of a trusted colleague you know 100%. that kind of cuts through the, that cuts through the the bs right there you know you don't have to kind of go through the process of vetting this person and going through all of the 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 um the recommendations and are the recommendations valid and you know who knows who this person is so i know that in in my past when i was in in positions of hiring people i was always using my network to hire so Today, particularly when you have this scale problem, you want to be using your network and build a referral network of people who can connect you to the opportunities, introduce you to people who either have an open position, know someone who has an open position, or are in the right part of the industry that you want to be a part of so that when something happens, they'll hear about it and they'll call you. So that's the mind shift that you want to you want to undergo from this kind of old fashioned submit your resume uh, practice into a modern networked approach to getting a job. And it's an old mindset, isn't it? I remember at school having to type out my CV, learning to put a resume together. Yeah. And I used to read, I'm like, who's going to read all of this crap? Like uh, half the stuff in here is just blown out of proportion. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> 16, hey. seven part-time jobs, number one. <laughs> By the way, you, you know, we talk about resumes. Uh, and the, the most important resume that any of us could ever have is on LinkedIn, Right. LinkedIn is the first place that a recruiter is going to go mm -hmm. because LinkedIn is a much better expression of who you are, all the different aspects of who you are than simply a paper resume. You've got to, you've got to have that resume to really summarize all of the important points. And that resume is going to be a valuable calling card and leave behind in the recruitment process. It's not going to get you in the door. But once you get in the door, that resume becomes the cheat sheet that you're going to use and that the employer is going to use to put you through this spanking machine, as I call it, to get to possibly receive that offer. So you want to make sure that the resume 
includes a subset, the important subset of what you do that's customized to appeal to that employer for that position. Mm. Like, rely on LinkedIn as that central clearinghouse. Mm. So it's a, it's a strategic approach to it. And it doesn't sound like it's a one-size-fits-all approach. And I've seen this before. People say, this is my CV, and I'm just going to blast it out to a 1,000 people. And it's not updated, not modified, not verified for right. each industry and each role. Right. Right. And from a company perspective, what we see with companies in Australia is, on average, 250 people apply for a job, 16 people get uh, qualified at the first stage, and then one or two people are actually offered the position. But there's also about a 50% decline rate from the employee side. They get to the final stage and say, you know what? Now that I've interviewed the company, I don't want to work with you. So even though we go through those processes, I believe that we shouldn't give up because there's always that opportunity that the person who's selected doesn't end up starting the job anyway. Right. So you're actually still in that talent pool. Yep. swimming around, so it's a good place to be. That's an important point, and I think that's something that that candidates fail to appreciate because they're so focused on getting the job, is that the whole process of applying is really a networking opportunity for the future. It's an investment mm. in your future career because the relationships that you can make and build over the course of looking for a job can be instrumental in your career success once you land because think of it this way if you are aiming at a particular sector particular kind of role all of the positions that you're applying to that you get into interviews on are all within this same frame the ones that you don't get the ones that you pass on those are all new relationships that could possibly work for you down the road so every person that you meet along the way is someone that you want to maintain a relationship with. It's not mm -hmm. someone, just a transactional person that you're kind of scattering behind you as you pursue your goal. This is part of your process. I was working with one of our companies in Australia that I consult with, and we had an applicant come through. His resume was perfect. His references were great. And then we got into the interview. And we're talking about strengths. And I believe it's very easy for people to talk about their strengths. And then we started to talk about limitations. And the reason why we were talking about limitations was we wanted to gauge this person's level of emotional intelligence. Yes, you know all of your strengths, but what about your weaknesses? And so the conversation summarized to a couple of key words. What are some of your limitations? What don't you do well? And the applicant looked at us and said, chocolate? And we said, what? And he said, my weakness is chocolate. <laughs> and the owner looked at me and it's a nine figure business. And he went, chocolate. <laughs> and the, uh, the owner just closed the book and said, thank you so much for your time. Right. But right. Uh, we're looking for something different. So yeah. the point that I want to make is we all have limitations and don't be shy about it. It's good to share what your limitations are. It's like me. I love to work in a fast-paced environment. I don't like to work in a repetitive environment where the same thing's expected day in, day out. That's my limitation. And I'm better off to say that up front because even though you might be uh, being selected for this current role, through that recruitment process, they might say, you know what, this person is better suited over here. And they could open up a totally new role that you didn't even know was being advertised. So Absolutely there's multiple right. chances, and, and that's yeah. the growth of the company. Yeah. Where can we put people? I would, I would add to that is, and, and I think this is a great point, and it's it, you know, back to this question of, of uh, the fears that we have about the job search process and the comfort zone that we have. Mm. Uh, the mindset shift here is to look at your challenges, your weaknesses, your stretches, whatever you want to call it, as a strength, right? Mm. That... Your ability, again, you're talking about emotional intelligence, your ability to acknowledge where you're strong, where you're weak, where you're also, and this is the point I want to make, where you're working on it, where you are improving, right? Where these are areas of focus that you are looking to improve. So I think there, there are three levels here. One is what are your strengths? And then what are your weaknesses? Which is like, don't put me in on that area. 
but here's something that I'm trying to improve on, right? Mm -hmm. Here is an area where I'm adopting a growth mindset about myself and my work so that I can be a better professional by expanding on areas where I can expand and I can learn and I can grow. I think that's a really important point that employers want to know. Mm. We, we really, a lot of us have these perfectionist tendencies, but we don't expect everything to be perfect. We go on the world's best airline and we expect there's going to be delay. We get on there and we expect we're not going to get our chicken meal, but we know we're going to get a beef meal. And all of us have shortfalls. And if we go and go onto Amazon and a company has a perfect five-star rating and 10,000 reviews, we're already skeptical because we start to dig deep and go, come on, that can't be right. There's got to be something. So be the first one to, to share it. And we have our strengths. We have our areas of growth. And a company is more concerned, in my opinion, is this person coachable? Are they trainable? Is their mind open enough? And are they willing to adopt some new behaviors? This is why and, I talk about the idea of, of, uh, of, of uh, areas that you're working on. Because the, yeah. that immediately goes to the fact that, as you say, coachable, trainable, interested in growth, uh, and uh, interested in uh, adapting to change, mm -hmm. because change mm -hmm. will happen. So you want to be able to bring someone into the company and six months later say, look, your role is changing. We hired you to do this, but we need you to take on this additional, or we need you to subtract this and add this. How are you with that? And the person goes, absolutely great. I, in, I'm excited about the challenge as opposed to, well, can I just hold on to this? And you know, I mean, someone's going to kind of try to negotiate their way out of it. It's what Darwin said, wasn't it? It's not the strongest of the species that survive. It's the most adaptable to change. And adaptability is a soft skill. And employers can measure that using scientific instruments or they can gauge it in a conversation. And adaptability is key. And I believe we all need to be more flexible and more adaptable in this new world because Absolutely. what worked yesterday might not work tomorrow and we've got to learn something new. We can't just keep going back to the past and saying, I'm going to try harder this time, John. I'm just going to be more enthusiastic. <laughs> okay, that used to work. Let's try something new. Now, you've got a great website here with so much content and information to help people find their dream career. Where should we start when we go to your website? Where do we start? Well, start at the, at the homepage, which is uh, johntarnoff.com. And uh, I would also say, look at the blog because I publish uh, every couple of weeks uh, and I talk about uh, job search skills, uh, career planning, uh, and, and a bunch of areas uh, around uh, uh, skill sets that, uh, that are gonna be helpful for people who are kind of subscribing to this, this new way of um, empowering yourself in your job search to define your value proposition, use your network, uh, develop a professional brand around your expertise, uh, and uh, you know, uh, learn from, from there and, and uh, you know, take it and, uh, and, and use it effectively. I love what it says here. Learn how to sell yourself and build your confidence. The amount of times people have said to me over the years, Daniel, I'm not a salesperson. Mm. And I say, bullshit. You are. Yes. You've got to sell yourself every day. You might have to sell your ideas. That post is directly aimed at the person who says, and I think in the first paragraph, I, I, I say, clients say to me, oh, I can sell anything, but I can't sell myself. And as you say, that's BS because you've been selling yourself since you were a little kid and you're trying to get your parents to buy you with that toy for the holidays, right? So we all know how to sell. The question is, what's the methodology behind it that's going to help you in your career to move that forward? A lot of people don't like that word selling. So if you don't like selling and you want to play with the words, call it attention. Call it getting attention. You know, attention is the most precious commodity on the planet. Every advertiser knows that on Super Bowl Sunday. They're mm -hmm. willing to spend tens of millions of dollars to capture your attention for that 90 second commercial. And you've got to be able to capture people's attention. And it's a strategy, it's a skill, and it's something that you can't leave to chance. You can't just fly from the seam of your pants on that one. You've got to know because there's, like it says on the screen here, it says uh, buy and sell. There's a way people buy and there's a way people sell. And you've got to sell your ideas in a way that people will buy into you and your ideas. Yeah. So important. 
There's a story that I tell often about uh, my time with uh, DreamWorks Animation, and I was taking uh, some of our executives out uh, on a regular basis to schools. Uh, we, 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 I started a recruiting program to get kids out of colleges and universities into our uh, artistic and technical programs. And I would pretty often take our CEO, Jeffrey Katzenberg, out to schools. And he was great working, uh, working, out, working a room. And I remember one kid at one point asked him, said, uh, so Jeffrey, so uh, shouldn't my work speak for itself? And Jeffrey turned around, he thought a minute, he said, well, in a perfect world, yes, your work should speak for itself. He said, but in the real world, you have to speak for your work. And I always thought that was a wonderful way of putting it and really framing the situation of selling yourself in a way which is not about doing something dishonest, but really speaking for something that you hold dear, that's really core to who you are. And if you can embody that and really get to a place where you're clear about what your value is and you love the value that you, that you express, the service that you render to the employer or the client that you're working with, then it's not about selling at all. Mm, I love that. Ladies and gentlemen, I want you to go over to johntarnoff.com. Here's the website. And go and go to the blog, borrow the ideas that John's got here, and watch his other TED Talks. Watch him on television here. Got some great ideas. And the reality is, if you don't want to be a business owner, and you don't have to be an entrepreneur to succeed, you can become very successful with a career. And if it's time for you to move on, to update your career, then come over here and learn some of these new ideas. There's wonderful steps. There's wonderful ideas. Grab a copy of his book, Boomer Reinvention. So if you're over 50, don't delay. Do it now. John, thank you so much for being here with us today. Your final words of wisdom to share with our friends who are looking for a dream career. Stop chasing open positions. Start building relationships. There you go. Head over to johntarnoff.com today. And remember, one new idea at the right time is enough to change life. Ladies and gentlemen, have a wonderful day. Thank you, John. Beautiful. Wow.